So th thanks everyone for coming. Um, my name is Joe Bailey. I'm here with Ann McQuestin. Um, and we are both with the law firm Perkins Coie. Um, we're both based out of Portland, Oregon. Um, although as of recently, we have one partner, John Thomas over there, who's relocated to Bend. Um, so we're taking over the city. Um, so we are here today to talk about uh, financing fundamentals. And do we got the slides, do we got our deck going? Awesome. Cool. So we're going to talk, uh, you know, briefly and try to keep it super conversational and take some questions if people either in the room or out there in the virtual sphere have any questions for us. Um, a little bit about uh, both Anne and I. Um, I'll start with myself. So my my practice um, is is focused on representing companies and investors in uh, financing transactions and M&A transactions, and then for you know, for startup clients who we represent, we really serve as outside general counsel um, and provide, you know, all sorts of legal services and serve as a gateway to the broader firm, um, which Perkins Coie, um, we've, we've got a little over like 1,100 lawyers at the moment and we have offices around the country um, with a really strong focus um, in the Northwest on, on technology companies um, and also food and beverage and consumer apparel companies. Um, so our practice, uh, both nationwide and locally, is in a lot of ways similar to kind of those core uh, companies where we see a lot of growth here in the state of Oregon. Um, in terms of uh, representative clients, uh, you know, really it, it ranges from small startups to large companies like myself. Um, I do a lot of work with you know, on a large scale with Microsoft uh, as part of their acquisition programs, um, but also work with a lot of local companies like you know, Sheer ID, for example, is a, a longtime client uh, based out of Eugene. And Anne, if you want to say, introduce yourself. Sure. Th thanks, everyone. Um, I'm Anne McQuestin, uh, as Joe mentioned, also a member of our corporate group here uh, in, or in the Portland office of Perkins Coie, uh, where I, similar to Joe, work with uh, companies and investors kind of from the very first early stages of startup through their growth trajectory, um, financing rounds, and ultimately uh, acquisitions. Um, and just to kind of add to uh, the experience that, that we have in our office, it's been really fun for us to also represent um, companies that have actually come out of the Ben Venture Conference successfully. So over the last two years, we've worked with um, companies like Talcoot, which was a winner uh, two years ago, and Fleet Nurse, which, which was a winner last year, I believe, um, on their funding rounds coming out of the conference. So. It's a very meaningful conference to us and our clients, and we're just really glad to be able to be involved. Great. Um, so we want to. What we want to do is talk about to talk to those entrepreneurs um, and also investors too who are thinking about raising an initial round of funding. Now, I think we all know there's a whole boatload of ways that you can finance a business. Um, raising, you know, you can bootstrap it and just in finance with, with customer payments and deposits. You can, um, you know, there's grant funding available from government and other, other nonprofit agencies. Um, you know, in, in, for some businesses, debt financing makes sense. Um, but I think, a, you know, this is ultimately a venture conference. And I think when people think about financing their startup, equity financing, um, selling ownership interests in the company to investors is top of mind. So we want to talk about just kind of three, three points that we want you to take away um, with respect to, to, have, to have in your mind if you're thinking about an equity financing. And that's just your, your preparation, kind of those conversations you need to have with yourself and with your key advisors before you pull the trigger on a funding round. Um, and then a little bit of education about the predominant financing instruments that we see uh, startup companies using. And then lastly, as counsel, um, a reminder to follow the rules uh, regarding securities laws. So we want to make sure to hit on that quickly at the end. Um, so I'm going to kick it over to Anne to get us started on first topic. All right. So, um, so the first topic that we wanted to just point out as and kind of as a first 
thing for you to be thinking about as you're going out and starting to consider raising an outside funding round is what are the conversations that you need to be having both internally in, in your company, um, so whether that's with your co-founders or um, advisors or uh, anyone else that you know, may be impacted by, by the process of going out and raising external funding, um, and also with other, uh, you know, potentially going out and talking with other entrepreneurs about what experiences they have had um, and what you should be thinking about in terms of raising funding and what, uh, what you're going to be expecting as you go through that process. Um, so the first topic is on valuation. And that's something that, you know, at the very early stages, you just may not really be thinking about your company in terms of what's the enterprise value of what this company is worth but it's gonna be very high on the mind of investors because ultimately what they're looking for is a high value, high growth company. So um, as Joe will talk about a little bit later, the topic of actually coming up with a valuation for the company for purposes of your, um, the investment round is gonna vary. Um, it's gonna be much more relevant if you're doing a, a priced equity round versus some of the other forms of funding that we'll talk about, um, convertible notes and safes specifically, um, but it's still relevant and, and it's something just to kind of be thinking about as you enter the stage of being a company that has investors and is looking for high growth and potentially an exit opportunity. Um, so, so, you know, one of the things that will be key in, this, in the conversation with investors is being able to back up the valuation that you're suggesting sh that someone should value your company at. Um, so that could be some, you know, later on, it could be based on revenues, um, EBITDA, if, if, if that's a um, stage that your company is at where, you, where you're um, generating positive uh, revenues and EBITDA. Uh, but it could also be other metrics like mo monthly active users for certain software. Um, but just, you know, having something tangible or um, in mind that, that you can talk with investors about to justify why they should value your company the way that you think it should be valued. Next to, to think about, um, you know, when you start your company, you and your co-founders uh, typically will own the entire company and, and have not only complete freedom over the company's operations, but complete uh, ownership of, of the equity and complete um, opportunity in, in the exit of the company. And that obviously changes when you do start to take in external investment. Um, so this is something that often, um, you know, founders struggle with a little bit to, to give up some of that um, value that, that you feel like you put so much in to generate and, um, and give up sort of a piece of the pie. But the way that uh, you know, we talk about it with clients and investors is really what you're, what you're doing is taking a smaller piece of the pie, but it's a much bigger pie once you get the investment in and have the capital to pursue the opportunities that are gonna get your company to um, the next level. So in some ways, it's sort of a, a necessary part of the process, but just something to, to think about and when you're doing your calculations of, you know, what, looking at the valuation and the dilution, how do those things work together um, to get to the right mix for, for the company and the investors. And one other piece on dilution just to keep in mind um, is that investors and also employees that you might be uh, recruiting for your business are probably going to expect, uh, in a lot of cases, some employee equity program or pools through stock options or, or otherwise. So that all plays into that concept of dilution. How much of the company's equity are you going to set aside for employees and how much are, uh, how much are investors going to expect for you to set aside to be able to recruit high quality, top tier talent um, for your company to, uh, to enable it to grow in the way that the investors are expecting. So talking about bringing investors in and, and giving up some of the equity, um, negotiating over valuation, another piece of that is just these are additional stakeholders that you will have 
in your company and will expect some degree of, of oversight and accountability from, from the founders and from the uh, internal team. So going from you know, not really having to answer to anyone other than you know, maybe your customers to these internal uh, people, whether it's the investors, um, oftentimes when you take an external investment, there will be an expectation um, for the investors to have a place at the board of directors. So having you know, regular uh, board of director meetings and, um, and board reports, investor reports, and sometimes this is kind of a less formal uh, consideration where you, know, you just have investors out there who own uh, equity in the company and are just gonna expect some communication and other times there are contractual obligations embedded in, in the investment itself uh, where you're actually obligated to provide periodic reports to the, um, to the investors, financial statements, um, sometimes even financial statements that are reviewed or audited by, by accountants. Um, so just kind of additional um, things that you'll have to think about in addition to just sort of running the company, being, um, being accountable to the, the people that you're bringing in. Um, and, you know, it's, it's, it's not all just a burden in, in the sense that keeping people, keeping your uh, investors and your advisors informed is going to allow them to provide you with uh, advice on, you know, if they see things going in a certain direction, they may have had experience um, with their other portfolio companies to be able to give you guidance. And also if they see things going, you know, maybe in, in not the best direction, if you've kept them informed, it's gonna result in much better relations if they've kind of known that all along than just all of a sudden, you know, when things have gotten to a critical point. Um, going out and you know asking for additional capital or, or whatever the the um, communication might be when things uh, are are beyond the point of you know being able to step in and, and help out. And final point as you're thinking about what you need to do to prepare to raise capital is preparing to participate in the due diligence process. So. Um, Generally speaking, investors are going to want to do some due diligence or investigation into your company. And that's going to span things like looking at your, your cap table and, and what you've done with issuing equity um, to date. Uh, IP ownership is, is always an important one, making sure the company uh, owns the critical pieces of intellectual property that the investor thinks they're investing in. Um, and then other kind of key contracts maybe that, that you might have with the company um, or, or key documents um, that, that are um, part of the company's history. So having all of that ready to go is not only gonna make life easier for you, it's gonna just appear a lot better to the investor if they come in and see a clean company that has kept its records well um, and, and has everything sort of tied up in a neat little package ready to go. Um, so we, we actually talked about this uh, a little bit last year in, in a different context, in the M&A context when we were uh, here, but there's, there are a lot of things that you can do, such as starting a data room early, keeping all your documents in one place, and you can certainly talk with your advisors about how to do that. Um, but, and, and it's never too early. You know, I actually recently went through a, a financing transaction where the company was really pretty newly formed and had just done, you know, a handful of stock option grants that were not, not done well because they hadn't really brought in advisors, their, their attorneys and, um, and financial advisors to help with them with that process. And it ended up requiring a lot of cleanup and, um, and it's just, you know, unfortunate to have to do that and spend money on that when the company, you know, easily could have just done it, um, done it correctly from the outset and, um, and avoided not only having to, you know, explain to the investors why things were not how they should be, but also spend the money to fix it. So a little bit, uh, it's the, the ounce of prevention um, in preparing for due diligence that can really pay off in the end. Great. So 
you, you get through all that, you're ready to go. You're ready to, you're ready to raise funding from outside investors. Um, the next question inevitably when people come in to talk is, you know, what, what, how, what, what are we offering investors? What is that going to look like? Are we selling stock? I heard about convertible notes. I heard about safes. What are those? Um, talk about those. And usually people have some idea and you hear from other successful entrepreneurs, hey, this is what we did. Um, you know, this is what you should do. So kind of three, three big options, and I'll talk a little bit about them. Um, and let's start with uh, a price round because I think that's the easiest thing to understand. A price round is you're selling stock, which it could be common stock, but typically it's going to be preferred stock that gives the investor a liquidation preference such that they get their money back before um, the common stockholders get a return um, on, on dissolution or an M&A event. So price round, they come in, they said, okay, what's pre-money valuation for the company? $10 million. Uh, here's what the price per share is going to be. And when you're doing a price round, typically that's going to come with a broader set of investor rights, um, you know, typically board representation, more contractual rights, um, longer documentation. So that's, that's price round. Um, as an alternative, a convertible debt round or a safe. So convertible debt, um, I think, you know, most people in this room are pretty familiar with it, but just, just to run it down, you're going to have a, a promissory net note. So it's debt. It has a maturity date. It has interest. Um, you have to pay it back. And if you don't, uh, the holder of the note um, or a majority of the holders of the note, depending how you structure it, can, you know, bring a lawsuit and demand payment. Um, so that's convertible debt. But the key to that is not its debt-like features, but that it converts into a future equity round. Um, and typically, it's going to convert into a future equity round at a, either a discount to the price per share of that future equity round, or um, a, there's going to be a valuation cap. So you, know, you, might, you might raise a million dollars on a note and it would have a valuation cap in place that says, you know, when it converts, it's not going to convert at a, at a valuation greater than $10 million. So you raise $1 million on the note, $10 million valuation cap. You guys just, you crush it. And then you raise a Series A financing at a $50 million valuation. That $1 million, it comes in based on a $10 million valuation. So they get 10% of the company instead of 2% of the company. That's how it works. Safes are similar to convertible debt in that they, they convert into a future round of equity um, and similar concepts of discounts or valuation caps or both um, in place with safes. But key difference there is they're structured so that they're not debt. There's not a ability for an investor to for, can, you know, go to court and demand repayment. Similarly, there's no interest that goes along with safes. All right, so in choosing, in choosing between these, you know, number of factors, and, and I'll try to distill down a few. One big benefit to, you know, maybe it's a benefit, one, one benefit that people ascribe to convertible debt or safes is you don't need to fix, fix a valuation right now. It, it's a, the, the conversion price of those instruments is based on the valuation agreed to in the next financing round. As a result of that, you don't have to have those detailed valuation conversations with your investor, and that can speed up the time to closing. Uh, similarly, with the convertible debt or the safe, um, there's a lot fewer investor rights that go along with them. There's, you know, there's not going to be board rep representation, um, less contractual rights with, with those. And so as a result of that, not only is it faster to get it done, but there's less, um, you know, role for Ann and me in that. So it's cheaper. There's less, there's less legal costs that go along with it. Um, now with, um, like we said earlier, convertible debt, key difference between that and safes, you've got interest and you've got a maturity date. And from a, from a company point of view, if you're thinking about 
do we do convertible debt or a safe? What's attractive about the safe is, is exactly that. You're not gonna get to a maturity date down the line where an investor is gonna be able to force repayment. That said, for many companies, if, if you haven't generated traction in you know, the 18 months until your maturity date, um, such, that, you know, such that you're not able to raise another financing, in, in many cases, you know, investors, it's, they're going to be fairly, they're going to be practical. Either, either this company has a future or it doesn't. Um, but still, uh, you know, if, if, you're on, if you're an entrepreneur, all else being equal, you'd rather not have interest in a maturity date. But, but caveat to that is many investors like having those protections built in place. And, and I'd say we've, we've found that, um, at least in Oregon, convertible notes still you know, the predominant, predominant over safes. We definitely see safes all the time, but not as frequently as convertible notes. I'd, I'd say that safes have greater um, adoption in, in, in the Valley. Um, so if you've got Valley investors who are coming in, you might, it, might, it might sell better, but you, you gotta be thinking in Oregon, you know, if, you're, if you're raising just from local angels, you know, you got to think, well, is this going to be as marketable to them? Um, so that's definitely a consideration. Now, kind of talked about what are, you know, what are the benefits of, we've talked about why it might be beneficial to do convertible debt or a safe over a price round. Um, I think there's still a lot to be said for just doing that price round, you know, off, off, off the bat. Um, first, you're, you're essentially with the convertible note of the safe, you are kicking the can down the road on having these conversations about what's governance gonna look like with our, with our investors, what's our valuation gonna look like. And then from the investor side, one huge benefit to doing a price round is the ability to start your holding period for qualified small business stock. And just by show of hands, how many folks in here are kind of familiar with qualified small business stock or 1202 stock? That's the section of the IRC. So maybe like, maybe like half. So um, qualified small business stock is an incredibly powerful tool because it allows for companies that meet certain criteria of growth companies. They're not, they're not too big and they're you know, not in certain prohibited industries. Um, an investment in their stock, if held for five years, can exclude can when when sold, the investor can exclude capital gains up to um, ten million dollars or or potentially greater, depending on the the basis in the stock. So it can be enormously valuable to juice investor returns. But you got to hold the stock for five years. So if you're investing in a convertible note, and that note takes 15 months to convert to a price round, you don't start the clock at the time of your initial investment. The investment starts when, the, the clock starts when it converts. Safes are a little bit tricky because the tax treatment of them, whether they're equity or debt, is still a little bit, um, it hasn't been as fleshed out. It's a, it's a, new, it's a new product. Um, but if you're thinking about convertible note or price round as investors, the ability to get that time period going for QSBS stock is, is hugely valuable. All right. One, one, last, um, one last thing to, that I want to highlight, if you're doing a, a note round or a safe round that you want to be really, really careful about is, so I'm selling a convertible note, and that note is going to convert into whatever security you're selling in your next price round. So you sell a convertible note, and then you do a Series A round, which presumably, you know, it's going to have a higher valuation. That note, let's say it converts at a 20% discount to the price in the next round. So if, if you're in next round, and if the Series A investors are paying $5 a share, your note converts at $4 a share. So that's, you get that you get that discount, you get that premium to compensate you for making the early risk. You, you just, you know, t in going through it, talk to your counsel, you want to be careful that it converts, it converts into that same stock, but you want to tweak the stock that it converts into. It should be a, a second series of stock that has a lower liquidation preference. 
than the Series A, so that your your liquidation, your investor's liquidation preference should only um, be equal to the amount of cash they put into the company. It shouldn't get goosed by by their um, discount. You get it. You get the discount for purposes of the 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 common stock value of the stock of the shares, but you don't want to give them. You don't want to let your investors get a discount on the liquidation preference because otherwise you just get you get an overhang, um, and there's more. You know, liquidation preference. Ideally, you want to, as an entrepreneur, you want to limit it so no one has a liquidation preference in excess of the cash they put into the company. So that's something we see get screwed up a lot with a lot of notes, um, and it's uh, you know it, it can definitely be avoided if you're thoughtful about it uh, from the get go. All right, and. Um we wouldn't be doing our job as lawyers without raising a bunch of red flags at the end on the process. Um, so last thing that we want to highlight before we open up the floor for questions is um, whether you're raising funds through, prefer through a price round, um, through notes, safes, um, and probably any other sort of um, hybrid instrument that you might come across in this context you are selling securities, um, which is a regulated area of the law, um, highly regulated both federally and at a state-by-state -state level. So um, if you are selling securities, then they need to either be registered with the Securities and Exchange Commission or exempt from registration under both state and federal law. And, um, and when we say registered with the SEC, that is, it's an extensive process. It's, it's essentially the process that companies go through when they are going public. So it's, um, you know, a lot of work on the legal and accounting side, a lot of compliance requirements, and something that most companies, you know, never get to the point of, of registering their shares and certainly not, you know, at the startup um, level where you may be uh, entertaining these, these types of early stage investments. So, you know, really what you're looking at is exemptions from registration. Um, so we'll talk about a couple of the most, um, most common exemptions, but um, just kind of to give you a sense of why it's important to be confident that you, you have an exemption available is that if you um, sell securities and, and don't do that in compliance with the applicable law, your investors can have a right to rescission, which means that they can come to you and ask for their money back. Um, and typically that's, you know, that may not be right away, so you will have already spent the money in the company um, and, and that's just really gonna put your, your business in a bad situation. So understanding and knowing your, your securities compliance and your exemptions up front is, is very critical. Um, one, one, um, Pretty, pretty standard and you know relatively easy way to do that is by selling securities to only accredited investors, um, because there is a federal securities exemption for sales to um, accredit all or um, or most accredited investors, and in that case you are generally um, exempt or um, preempted from state securities compliance requirements other than, you know, potentially some, some notice requirements that you would need to make. And you can sell an unlimited amount of, um, of dollar value of securities to accredited investors under this exemption in a pretty streamlined way. Um, so what is an accredited investor? There, there's a whole long, um, well, somewhat long list uh, under the, the, the SEC regulations, but probably the most common that we see are um, one, uh, certain entities that have more than $5 million in assets and aren't formed for the specific purpose of acquiring the securities that you're offering. So think of your typical venture capital and, and maybe angel funds. Um, another for entities is just entities where all of the equity owners in the entity are accredited investors themselves. And as far as individual accredited investors go, it, um, typically, it would be a, an individual or um, sp spousal pair 
um, that has over $200,000 in annual income over the last two years um, for an individual or $300,000 with, with the person's spouse or over a million dollars um, net worth, which does not include the value of that person's primary residence. So what we're really talking about is um, entities that have, um, that are sufficiently capitalized and have, have, have significant assets or in high net worth individuals. Um, the SEC has very recently expanded the accredited investor definition for the first time in, in many years, um, but the expansion is, is fairly modest. It, it adds a few additional categories, um, but does not change those, um, specifically it does not change those individual net worth or income requirements if you're looking to raise capital from, um, from individuals. Um, and so, you know, I, I, I would say generally, we, when we're talking to companies, we, we talk about raising funds from accredited investors as the safest and most streamlined and most typical approach. There are other um, exemptions and ways that you can raise funds from unaccredited investors and still be exempt from registration. Um, but just to note that that's really, um, it, it, it does complicate your securities compliance down the road. And, um, and can, can in, increase your costs actually of, um, of doing your offering because of additional requirements and disclosures that you'll need to make to unaccredited investors. And with that, uh, I think we have a, a little bit of time for questions. So I um, wanna open up the floor if anyone has anything you'd like to ask. Yeah, so the, the question is with individuals, if they're you know, saying that they meet the, the income or net worth standard. Hey, Joe, can you use your mic, please? Yes. Yes, I can. Question is, for, for individuals, what steps do you need to take to verify that they meet the accredit, accreditation standards? Um, and the answer is, it depends. Um, if, you are, if you are doing a, just your basic offering um, in, a, in a private placement to accredited investors, you, you can rely on, on their self-certification. Now, if you, if you happen to know that this person is you know, you're searching this person is lying to you, you, you know, you need to be, you need to use judgment on whether you can reasonably rely, but it's, it's fine to, to, re, to just rely on that certification. Now, there is a, another exemption available um, called Rule 506C. Most of the time when we do a financing, it's Rule 506B, but Rule 506C is similar, but it also, allows a company to do what's called a general solicitation, um, where you're, you're kind of going out in, in a more public way, marketing the securities, which is normally a no-no for a private financing. If you're doing a general solicitation, then you need to take some further steps to, to verify that people are accredited investors, such as you know, requesting bank statements or things like that, like you would when you're applying for a mortgage. So that's one of the reasons we as counsel you know, caution against doing a 506C with a general solicitation, because then you get you have to kind of get in people's business, which, which they're gonna think is weird, because normally, for most investments, they're able to just sign an accredited, a question, accredited investor questionnaire and go about their day. Sure. Yeah. I, so, um, you know, the, the, the first question is, you know, what, what exposure do you have for that initial round? Um, and that is, you know, kind of what, what I hit on, which is there are certain remedies if you, if you didn't comply with the exemption um, or, or weren't registered 
that those investors would, would have the ability to, um, to ask for their money back. In your next round, you know, this, could, this could be a due diligence issue for your future investors, um, wanting to know that you've done all of your securities uh, offerings previous to the, the current round in compliance with the securities laws. And you know, it, could, it, it could raise you know, concerns that down the road this, this um, rescission right could come up and then they would have put their money into the company and, and have to have that used to buy out those unaccredited investors. Um, and so there's, there's always the risk out there, um, uh, you know, with respect to the prior offering, but there's also just kind of the due, due diligence risk down the road as well. Um, one thing that you do occasionally see is um, in later rounds of financing, new investors, especially where you've, you know, maybe raised small amounts from a lot of different people, is new investors coming in and wanting to kind of clean up the cap table. And, and potentially buy out prior investors. Um, so, you know, sometimes there are opportunities to kind of clean that, that past um, fundraising up a little bit, but it's, it's certainly something that, you know, could, could come up as a, a, you know, a concern of a, of a future investor. Yeah. It, I'd say not necessarily because it, it's going to depend on the facts and, you can sell to unaccredited investors in ways that still comply with the securities laws. You know, we'd need to kind of see, you, you sit down with your counsel and like, oh, here's what we did. And then you can map out, well, there was an exemption here and this person qualifies here. So they're definitely, you're not necessarily, you know, it, by no means, just selling to an accredited investor, unaccredited investor doesn't mean that, that you violate the securities law at all. Um, it, it, you know, it, it makes it more likely that there could have been a, value, a, a violation, but you'd have to look at the facts. So it's not, it's sort of hard to quantify in that, in that way. And, and if, if, it was, if it was still compliant with the securities laws, then you could say, well, yeah, we did have some unaccredited, here's, hey, new investor, here's how we, here's how we complied, this is what our counsel said. And, and I think people are gonna be satisfied and there doesn't necessarily have to be clean up. Now, one of the other things, that it can make it more difficult is there's types of transactions you might do in the future where it's just really nice if everyone's in an accredited investor. Sometimes companies get acquired um, and the deal consideration is stock and the buyer says, well, I don't, I don't wanna be offering this stock to unaccredited investors. So you gotta you know, have some cash for those unaccredited. So there's, you know, there's complications, but if you've if you've got some unaccredited in your cap table, um, you're not the only one, um, and and you're not sunk. But it's it's a good thing to talk about with your counsel. Like, hey, here's here's how we did it, so you have a coherent story to tell. I think we're cl uh, actually a few minutes. Um, after the time, but I know there are some remote viewers too, so just want to make sure if anyone did have any questions, we've addressed them. Um, and otherwise, oh. so from evaluation, an outside person valuing a company, how deep do they dig into these issues on you know the stock that they've already raised? Is it all up and up with the SEC or compliance? How much do outside valuators? Um, well, so if it's, if it's the, invest, the investor you're talking um, with that's, that you're kind of negotiating your valuation, they're going to be the ones that are kind of diligence, doing diligence on those issues. Um, so they may, you know, depending on the investor, they'll, they'll look at that at, in different levels of scrutiny. Um, I would say if you're, if you're talking about, you know, some sort of other third party uh, entity that's doing evaluation of the company for, you know, whatever other purpose, that's not, you know, they're going to be looking more at um, financial uh, performance, and I would say probably not as much legal compliance issues in terms of um, valuing the company and, you know, what the specifics of what a particular um, value valuator would do um, kind of depends on the what the valuation is going to be used for. I would say.
So the, the question on the screen in case, I don't know if everyone can see it, is of the investment types, what's the most common offered by an incubator program? Why? I, I think it's I think it's depend. I think safes are common with incubator programs because if, if you think about it, safes were originated by Y Combinator, kind of the granddaddy of incubator programs. Um, and there's there's a view there that they're more you know company company friendly. Um, and any other thoughts? Yeah, I would I would echo that. Um, I would say probably well. You know, it might just be whatever your current round is. Um, they'll they'll sort of add on to. But I would say if it's if it's just you know kind of a typical twenty five thousand dollar or or so investment that that an incubator gives all of its um, companies, I would expect something you know a safe or a convertible. I, I wouldn't typically expect that to be a priced round on its own. All right. Thanks.